The Windows operating system and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. They have greatly increased the number of PC users, and at the same time, they've created a complete bastardization of what the term personal computer actually means. Because with Windows, Microsoft is the one who ultimately decides how you use your PC, so there's nothing truly personal about a Windows machine. Now, there have been attempts over the years to recreate the Windows experience that's so familiar to people on a more freedom-respecting OS like a Linux desktop. And to this day, I think that Linux Mint does the best job at accomplishing this. But there's a new distro on the block that wants to try and take that throne called Wubuntu. This is a Wubuntu VM that I set up earlier today, and as you can see, it looks almost exactly like a default Windows 11 desktop. You've got the same theme, you've got the same desktop wallpaper, the same icon set, and it even comes preloaded with Microsoft Edge, OneDrive, and all of the Office 365 apps have a quick web page link that you can access from the start menu, which also looks very similar to the default Windows 11 start menu. You could probably sit a Windows user down in front of Ubuntu and they wouldn't even realize right away that they're using Linux. But there's a few things that you should know about before trying Ubuntu yourself or recommending it to someone who wants to get started with using Linux. Let's begin with the early life section. So Ubuntu actually started off as Linux FX. And if you were to visit their respective websites, you can see that they pretty much have the same layout. There's just a slightly different color scheme on the two websites. And if I scroll down on the Linux FX website to get some screenshots of the PCs, you can see right here on the left-hand side that this is actually a Ubuntu PC that they put a screenshot of here. And if there's still any doubts about the connection that these two operating systems have, we can go and visit their respective contact pages, and you're going to see the same exact Brazilian phone number to contact through WhatsApp for software support, I guess. Now, the reason for this rebranding is that Linux FX got a lot of bad press back in April of 2022 because it was revealed that their customer database had abysmal security. And luckily, the Linux FX devs had also been lying about the number of users that they had. Otherwise, this would have been a much bigger deal. So if we take a look at a snapshot of their website before this database leak incident, at the bottom here, they're claiming that they have 1 million plus users worldwide and that their OS gets 15,000 downloads per week. You see, every single Linux FX system gets registered to a MySQL database, which allows the devs to keep track of who actually paid for a valid license key and who's just using the free version of the OS, okay? Because you're not required to purchase a license key. They just strongly advise you to do so. And like I said, this database of users had really awful security. The credentials to it were actually hard-coded into the individual Linux FX systems, which just made a direct connection to the database instead of going through some sort of API layer. So it was really trivial to just dump out the entire thing, which revealed that Linux FX only really had about 20,000 users in total. And this dump also revealed the email addresses that were associated with all of the product keys for people that actually paid for Linux FX. And it also revealed the IP addresses of every active Linux FX machine in the world that was able to phone home to that central server. Now what's even worse than this incident is the way that the devs tried to fix the problem after they found out about it. I'm gonna leave links to both of these blog posts if you're interested in more details, but basically the Linux FX devs tried to prevent people from using sudo while the activation script in Linux FX was running because in order to get the details about the connection to the MySQL database and then to dump it, the person who hacked them before used BPF trace with sudo privileges on his system to do this. 
So the second time when sudo was blocked, he just used pk exec with some other slight modifications to the first bpf trace command to do effectively the same thing again. And this time the hacker even found a master product key that could be used to activate an infinite number of Linux FX machines. Now the Linux FX devs also decided that instead of hard coding the database credentials into the OS itself, they would store them in plain text on one of their web servers and have the activation program use curl to get those credentials to access the database when necessary. So again, huge security facepalm, but you know, maybe a long time Windows user that's looking for some salvation on another OS isn't gonna care so much about security because after all, they've been using Windows all this time and I'm sure that they can forgive the spyware because again, they're using Windows. So maybe they'll go on and use an OS that's made by some guy in Brazil and maybe they'll even pay him for a license key so that they can support the development of their new OS. But if that actually happened in mass, Ubuntu would end up suffering from its own success because they're probably violating a number of copyright trademarks. The Microsoft one is probably the most obvious since, well, they're targeting Windows users, or more specifically, they're targeting Windows users that are probably interested in Linux. But unlike the Linux Mint developers, these guys just straight up ripped off visual assets from Microsoft, stuck it in their own OS, and now they're trying to sell it. Now, technically, the Ubuntu devs word the purchasing of a product key as a donation. So maybe they're able to get away with that. I'm not really a legalese expert, but Ubuntu also makes the mistake of distributing proprietary software with the distro. So if we go back to my Ubuntu VM, you can of course see that Microsoft Edge is installed. And if we go into all apps, we've got some other things like Google Chrome and uh, all the way down here, we've got Steam that's installed as well. And I didn't install any of these manually after the fact. I just went through the installation steps for Ubuntu and all of these were present on my desktop. Now, of course, all of these can be installed on any Linux desktop, but typically they have to be manually put on there by the end user. Because if the distro maintainer were to ship the ISO with this software preloaded, then they would be violating the rule that's in the end user license agreement that virtually all proprietary software has, which says, you're not allowed to redistribute this program without express permission from Google, Valve, Microsoft, etc. So I think that the big boys could very easily bring crushing lawsuits against this company or whoever is responsible for developing Ubuntu, but it doesn't end there. They're also probably violating Canonical's copyright over Ubuntu as well. If we take a look at the intellectual property rights policy on Ubuntu's website, we can scroll down to section four and they tell us quite plainly that you will require Canonical's permission to use any mark ending with the letters Ubuntu or Ubuntu, which is sufficiently similar to the trademarks or any other confusingly similar mark and any trademark in a domain name or URL for merchandising purposes. Ubuntu, literally sounds like it should belong among the official forks that Canonical also has trademark over like Kubuntu or Zubuntu. Now, I did notice in the news section of Ubuntu.org that the latest version of this OS is codenamed Winx. So maybe they are aware of the trademark issues with Canonical and they're trying to get away from that, but there's still nothing on this website that just plainly states that they're not affiliated with Microsoft or Canonical, which I think would be a really smart thing to include just in the footer of your site, or maybe even just on the about section of your site in order to avoid all those trademark issues that I mentioned. Okay, so copyright violations aside and bad security rep aside, how does Ubuntu actually function as a Windows-like Linux distro. 
Well, I gotta be honest, from the little bit of testing I've done, it's actually pretty good. So Ubuntu basically bundles a lot of different projects into one system. Again, probably without getting official permission from the actual developers of these projects, but that's besides the point, clearly. So this entire Windows 11 theme, along with the icons and the fonts and the way that the Dolphin file manager is set up, all of that is actually available in the KDE store as a separate project. And you can also acquire it on GitHub. It's called Win 11 OS KDE. And as you can see here, it basically just rices your KDE for you so that it looks more like Windows 11. So that's what Ubuntu is using to pretty much get that look and feel of Windows 11. Uh, of course, all of the applications that we talked about earlier, these can all be installed on a Windows OS or on a Linux OS rather. Uh, all these Microsoft OneNote and, and Excel, all of these that say online basically are, like they said, they're online. If you click on them to open it, it just takes you to Microsoft's website to log into Office 365. So there's really nothing special there. Um, same deal with Copilot. Here it is down here. So, you know, Copilot ships with this, which you're like, oh my God, how did they get that to work? But it's not the same as the Copilot on Windows. This is basically just a headless browser window. So again, they're just using Copilot on the internet and this can be done on any Linux OS. Now, at first when I was using Ubuntu, I actually thought that this OneDrive integration was something unique to them because I've used a number of Windows-like Linux OSs before and I've never seen a OneDrive integration. But this actually did not come from the Ubuntu devs either. This is another separate project, OneDrive client for Linux that is available on any Linux operating system and it can be acquired from GitHub. So the only thing that I have found on Ubuntu that's actually unique to the devs is this thing called Power Tools. Um, so you see we have this thing and they actually call it the WinX Power Tools register here. This is another thing too that you're gonna see all throughout Ubuntu or WinX, whatever they're calling it, is there's all of these rebrandings that they do, but they only do kind of a half-assed job of it, right? Like certain areas are gonna call it Ubuntu, others are gonna call it WinX. Um, same thing with the Power Tools, like some of them call it Power Tools, but also some dialogues call it Power Toys really makes it confusing for the end users. So that's definitely a big gripe that I have besides the security issues and the trademark issues is that they don't consistently call things uh, by a universal name. But um, the main power tools thing is this uh, system dialogue box here. So this is very similar to the system dialogue box that you have on a Windows OS and it's probably the most similar one that I have seen on any Windows-like Linux system. Uh, so, oh, and this is also what you apparently pay the uh, registration key for. Like if I go back into this WinX Power Tools registration, this is what you pay for. And I guess it gives you better support over these programs specifically. I don't think it gives you any support over like OneDrive or obviously not Microsoft Edge or the theme, because all of that is made by different developers. So I guess this is what you're paying the $35 for, which doesn't really seem worth it to me. And also with the uh, database <laughs> issues that they had in the past, I would be really hesitant to pay them any money and give them my email address, which is how they send you the product key. Because again, there's a chance that that could get leaked in another database breach. Although they have, made an update to how the database is accessed. It actually goes through an API layer now. So it is a whole lot more secure, okay? I will give them credit for that. But if I had to give you my honest opinion of whether or not you should use this, I really think that people would be better off just using Kubuntu, right? So that's an official Ubuntu derivative that uses the KDE desktop environment, which is really what we're using here. And then like I showed you, you can just rice 
KDE to make it look like Windows 11, and you don't even have to do that manually. There's literally an automated installer for that. Um, you can put in the icon pack and everything like that to make it look like Windows 11. And then you can very easily create shortcuts to these Office Online apps. You can manually install Microsoft Edge if you want to do that. You can manually install Google Chrome. You can manually install Steam. And going through that process, although it might be uh, a little bit challenging for complete Linux noobs, it's actually going to better inform them of how their system works, right? Like it's gonna be a learning process. And they also don't have to do it on their own. Like if you're if you're a Linux evangelist, right? Like if you actually want to grow that desktop market share and get more people using Linux, then maybe you go over to your friend's house one weekend and you show them how to set up their Kubuntu OS to look exactly like Ubuntu so that they're not getting all confused and giving some dude in Brazil $35 to try and get support for just power tools. And I don't even know if you really get support for just power tools. Like they word it as a donation, so maybe it literally is just that, a donation to help them with developing this OS some more. And truth be told, trying to make Linux look more like Windows is kind of a cliche because once you've been using Linux for a while, you're probably going to end up moving towards a workflow that is drastically different than any version of Windows ever and basically optimizing your workflow for whatever work you're actually doing on your computer. So I think that's gonna ultimately be the best way to go if you decide to take the plunge into using Linux. If you enjoyed this video, please like and share it to hack the algorithm and buy some merch from my online store, base.win. 10% store-wide discount for paying in Monero XMR. Have a great rest of your day.